It's Tuesday, August 30th, 2022. I'm Jackson Bird. Today, the surprising history of how kale became so popular so quickly back in 2014, and how both Pizza Hut and Chick-fil-A were partially responsible, but not because they actually had kale on their menus. It's a tale of lawsuits, publicity campaigns, bloated markets, and one very big kale spiracy. Here's some cool stuff for your ride home. These days, we're long past the dogma of the food pyramid that simply told us two to three servings of fruits and three to five servings of vegetables per day were all we needed. Now, to stay healthy, we're told to specifically incorporate legumes, dark leafy greens, whole grains, and cruciferous vegetables. One of the best foods you can eat on a regular basis, we're told, is kale. But that wasn't always the case. According to a U.S. Department of Agriculture report from 2014, farmers produced 60% more kale in 2012 than they did in 2007. The early 2010s seems to be the tipping point when kale went from a rare health food not many non-farmers or non-health nuts had heard of to being recommended everywhere and incorporated into most restaurants' menus. I was reminded of this curious phenomenon when a friend shared a TikTok with me that is currently blowing up online. Made by TikToker Weak Ankle Blake, it reveals that until the year 2012, the largest purchaser of kale in the United States was Pizza Hut. And not because they sold it on any of their menu items, but because they used it as garnish in between dishes on their salad bars. This little factoid gets recycled online every now and then, ever since an episode of NPR's Ask Me Another, in which a caller revealed it as their favorite fun fact. NPR attempted to fact-check it then, tracing the claim all the way back to a 1996 cookbook called From Asparagus to Zucchini, and asking one of the co-authors who said that she used reputable sources for the book but didn't have any further citations for them. And when NPR reached out to Pizza Hut, the restaurant chain never got back to them. Fortunately, Earlier this year, Today was able to get in touch with the once pizza king, and a spokesperson told them, quote, Kale was actually used to cover up the ice that was used on the salad bar to keep everything cold. It was a common practice back then, end quote. And while we don't have the exact numbers to confirm that Pizza Hut was the number one purchaser of kale in the United States until 2012, the spokesperson was able to report that that year, the chain purchased almost 14,000 pounds of kale in the U.S. So, perhaps not the biggest, but still a huge purchaser. And the fact that so many of us could have visited those salad bars and not really recognized the ice-covering garnish as a food we regularly eat in our other salads or put in our smoothies also speaks to the fact that kale was not as ubiquitous back then. So how did it become such a trendy food so quickly? TikToker Blake was curious too, so he went digging and found another story that's been bouncing around the internet for six or seven years. In 2013, the American Kale Association hired a woman named Oberon Sinclair, who runs the boutique public relations firm My Young Auntie, to try to make kale cool, and she was enormously successful. Remember those sweatshirts that looked like they were for Yale University but actually said kale? Sinclair designed those. She also got trendy New York City restaurants to include more kale on their menus. She got celebrities to endorse kale recipes and wear the kale shirts. And remember Beyonce's 7-Eleven music video from 2014? In it, she's wearing one of the kale sweatshirts. A pretty successful PR campaign. The American Kale Association must have been quite pleased. If they existed... Thanks to some intrepid reporting by food and brand development writer Eve Turo for Mind Body Green in 2015, it was revealed that the American Kale Association never existed. Sinclair made it up. She gave them a sleek website and sizable social media following, claimed they had hired her PR firm, and used the undergirding of what sounded like a farmer's union to give the campaign a bit more legitimacy. 
After Turo spoke with a number of real farmers associations, unions, and kale farmers themselves, and none of them had heard of the American Kale Association, she finally got in touch with Sinclair, who, after her staff first gave Turo the runaround, eventually admitted that she was behind the American Kale Association. She told Turo's editors on a follow-up call, quote, It's my proudest campaign ever. I've been trying to convert people for years to eat in a healthy way. I've always loved kale. It's an amazing vegetable. I'm a punk at heart. I wanted to do something differently, and I did. End quote. So it was just one woman and her employees behind the huge kale craze that swept the nation in the mid-2010s. Now, that might seem pretty wild, but as Turo points out, it's not uncommon for one agency to be behind the popularization of a product that we later come to think of as fairly routine. Turo gives the example of the Lord & Thomas ad agency popularizing the concept of orange juice in the early 1900s. This campaign was mostly the brainchild of proto-Don Draper, Albert Lasker. Lasker was behind a ton of advertising campaigns that transformed the food we eat, the products we use, and how they're sold to us in the 20th century. Sometimes called the father of advertising, Lasker was instrumental in designing radio and TV to be driven by advertising. He introduced the strategy of writing persuasive copy on ads, not just describing what the products do. And he's even credited with inventing the soap opera. And when I was double-checking some facts on him this morning, I also learned that he produced one of the first corporate videos shown in public schools, specifically one that explained menstruation and puberty to students. He produced the video with none other than Disney, as well as a gynecologist to ensure accuracy, and all of this with the end goal of selling Kotex menstrual products. There are so many rabbit holes to go down with Albert Lasker, which I'm sure I'll get around to one day. But for now, I want to point out that while Lasker did promote the idea of drinking orange juice rather than just eating oranges around 1907 to help out orange growers with their glut of oranges, orange juice didn't really take off until after World War II. I went into this in more detail in the breakfast episode back in July, link in the show notes, but there were a lot of other changes in technology and public sentiment that had to develop before orange juice truly became a breakfast staple here in America. And so, even as Turo points out that some foods like orange juice were popularized by one sole party, we know that's not the whole story. And Oberon Sinclair making kale the next big thing all on her own is not the whole story here. But before we get into that, with a nod to Albert Lasker, a word from today's sponsors. So Oberon Sinclair has taken credit for the surge in popularity of kale. To this day, her Instagram refers to herself as vegetable royalty and the queen of kale. But just like Albert Lasker wasn't the only person who gave orange juice staying power in America, nor was Sinclair singularly responsible for kale's huge boost. And when you begin to dig into it, as Turo did in 2015, and subsequent reporters and researchers have over the years, some of the details fall apart fairly quickly. Sinclair began her campaign in 2013, with it really taking off, you know, getting into Beyonce territory in 2014. But, quoting Turo, In 2009, Bon Appetit ran a recipe for kale chips by Dan Barber, a renowned New York City chef. In 2010, Dr. Oz introduced kale to his viewers. Then, in 2011, Gwyneth Paltrow baked kale chips on Ellen. The following year, Bon Appetit named it the Year of Kale, while Time listed kale as one of the top 10 food trends of 2012. In 2013, National Kale Day was launched. End quote. And just anecdotally, I've been putting kale in my smoothies at the behest of food and health bloggers since, I want to say, at least 2011. So kale was already hitting a tipping point when Sinclair threw her hat in the ring. Did she make a big difference in kale becoming a trend vegetable that people want to display their love of on t-shirts and which became popular pub fare at bars? Yeah, we could probably give her credit for that, and even a bit more. You know, I might go as far as saying she definitely gets credit for making kale cool. But a number of kale farmers are reluctant to credit Sinclair with too much. 
That National Kale Day celebration, which launched the first year Sinclair started her campaign, was founded by Dr. Drew Ramsey, a farmer and clinical psychologist. Ramsey told National Geographic in 2016, quote, Sinclair was taking credit for a movement that belongs to the people, end quote. Kale, he says, really rose in popularity alongside the resurgence in popularity of farmers markets and the local food movement. At the same time, vegan and paleo diets, both of which make heavy use of kale, were also becoming more popular. And if we want to credit any one person, though as I intimated before, I'm always hesitant to do that, Ramsey would pick Paul Betts, a kale farmer from High Ledge Farm in Vermont. According to National Geographic, in the early 2000s, Betts had too much kale. To try to sell more of it, he got his friend Bo Muller Moore, a screen printer, to make some shirts that said, Eat More Kale. Especially after Betts used his adorable toddler as a model, the t-shirts became a hit, locally and eventually all over the country. Now, part of why the t-shirts spread and became so popular is because in 2011, Chick-fil-A sued Betts' screen printer, Moller Moore. The restaurant said that his Eat More Kale shirts were too similar to their slogan, Eat More Chicken. Now, I feel like I should clarify on this audio-based story that Moller Moore spelled more the normal way, M-O-R-E, while Chick-fil-A spells theirs M-O-R as if semi-literate cows are writing the slogan. If Muller Moore had spelled his shirts M-O-R, I feel like Chick-fil-A might have had a little more basis for their lawsuits. But in any case, when Muller Moore refused to back down, it made headlines around the nation and caused a bump in sales of the Eat More Kale t-shirts from people supporting David in the face of a chicken nugget Goliath. Unfortunately, the popularity of the t-shirts did not translate into enough of a bump in kale sales for bets. While kale did get so popular generally around 2011 that Betts told National Geographic the seed distribution company he worked for had to start sourcing new varieties from Europe, that didn't exactly translate to bigger income or the correct balance of supply and demand. Kale essentially became a boomtown. Here's how some farmers explained it to Tarot in 2015, quote, Many kale farmers are actually suffering from kale's sudden popularity. The demand is rising, but the supply is outpacing it, explained Charles Moronica, executive vice president of Moronica Farm Inc., then the largest shipper of bunched kale in the U.S. Ashley Rawl, the director of sales and marketing at Walter P. Rawl & Sons, a large kale farm in South Carolina, told a similar story. A lot more people have gotten in on the business, he explained. I'm sure there are some farmers who are winning who never grew kale before. But those of us who have been in the greens business all of our life, the demand has changed the dynamics of the business. Not only has more competition bombarded the kale landscape, but eating kale raw, Rawl said, means farms have had to develop intensive food safety measures for a green that used to just sit below plastic bowls of ice on buffet tables. End quote. The Hustle followed up on this story in 2018, explaining, quote, The U.S.'s 2012 Census of Agriculture shows that between 2007 and 2012, the number of kale farms grew from 954 to 2,500. But by 2016, kale farmers reported that the boom caused seed prices to rise almost 80% from 2013. And CBS reported that the spike in popularity was creating a major headache for some kale farmers as demand outpaced seed supply. Problem is, for farmers that rush to get in on the kale craze, once you go all in on a crop, it's pretty hard to stop. By the time kale suppliers started sourcing seeds from overseas, experts were already predicting a plateau. For many hot new superfoods, marketing spreads faster than research. Obscure foods can blow up based on outdated or narrow studies, and then lose popularity as new information comes out or as other health fads usurp them. Case in point, after a four-year hot streak from 2011 to 2015, coconut oil sales plummeted 24% in 2017 amidst new research that raised questions about its negative impact on cholesterol. End quote. The U.S. Census of Agriculture is taken every five years. The current one for 2022 is still underway, which means that the most recent one we have is from all the way back in 2017. Now, as stated in the Hustle quote, the number of kale farms in 2012 was 2,500. In 2017, it was just over 8,000. 
So kale apparently was still ballooning in popularity in 2017, at least among farmers. Then in 2019, we got a string of articles all declaring kale to be over. Those clickbait headlines were predominantly based on the first downward trend in kale sales in years. But by 2020, sales were back up 10%. As Amanda Mole pointed out in The Atlantic, one reason kale may continue to prevail in the market, even as other foods like Brussels sprouts and Swiss chard enter the ring, is that because kale isn't super tasty, completely raw and unprepared, people had to come up with all sorts of other ways to actually enjoy it. Chips, smoothies, sauces, dips, supplements sneaked into baked goods and even in baby food. And with all those new products loaded with kale, it can keep the market going even if kale as the entree may be on the decline, which was actually Mull's point back in 2019. You know, a lot of people like to hate on kale, which is fair. Anything that becomes too popular can become annoying. And when it's something that's an acquired taste or requires extra work, it can be additionally befuddling how anyone can actually like it. If you listen to my episode on the history of the IPA, in which I declared my love of them, it might not surprise you to know that I also not only eat kale almost every day, but I also grow it in small amounts myself. I don't own a sweatshirt declaring my love of it, but I guess I fully bought into the marketing campaign from 10 years ago, becoming convinced of its health benefits, which are both undeniable in general and sometimes exaggerated in detail. Kale has come a long way from lining the dishes on Pizza Hut's salad bar, but whether it continues its residence on actual salad bars at fast casual chains like Sweetgreen, or is relegated forever to the world of supplements and baby food, we'll just have to wait and see. And I mean, Swiss chard might be a bit tastier, but it doesn't look nearly as good printed on a sweatshirt. Well, today was one of those days in which I had a whole menu of segments planned out, and then I saw one TikTok and ended up spending hours going down a research pit and putting together this deep dive on kale. I hope you enjoyed it. I definitely do want to cover more about Albert Lasker, the father of advertising, another time. But tomorrow, we will be back to our regular fare of artificial intelligence, space, and weird things the Welsh get up to. And so that will be it from me for today. This show was produced by Ride Home Media. I'm Jackson Bird, and I'll talk to you again tomorrow.